Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and I will be your moderator for this evening. I'm very excited to welcome Ms. India Chance, a registered dental hygienist, certified infection control educator, and authorized OSHA trainer and CDC inspector for the Maryland State Board of Dental Examiners as our speaker tonight. She will cover tonight best practices for maintaining a sterilization room, as well as proper sterilization protocols. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box labeled, have a question. As we go through the presentation and we will answer them at the end, or if it's pertinent, I may interrupt Ms. Chance and we'll see how that goes. If you would like to request CE for tonight's webinar, please click on the CE available icon at the top of your screen and complete the survey. Ms. India Chance, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. I'll pass it over to you now. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to Henry Shine for hosting tonight. I uh, definitely appreciate the invite, but we are going to get right into it. We have a lot of uh, information to cover tonight. So my course tonight is called, Is Your Sterilization Area Compliant? A CDC Dental Board Inspector Weighs In, and that is me. Little disclosure information that I have to post. The most important thing on this slide is to make sure that you are applying your own professional judgment and experience with respect to all the information that I provide. You know, uh, some things that I will talk about will be suggestions and then other, you know, tasks and protocols I suggest uh, will, will be uh, according to CDC guidelines and OSHA mandates. My disclosures here, no commercial bias, nothing like that. And here are our objectives for tonight. Uh, I'm gonna interpret the uh, CDC guidelines on proper sterilization area setup for optimal infection prevention and control. Uh, we're gonna discuss the OSHA safety regulations that affect the sterilization area. And we're also gonna review detailed instruction on the CDC recommended practices for instrument reprocessing as a key infection prevention technique, including sterilization and disinfection of patient care devices. I always like to start with what's happening around the country when I'm talking about uh, infection prevention and control, because although you might work in a practice where you've never experienced an inspection, you don't know what it looks like to have that happen, um, you're doing everything correctly according to the guidelines, it's still important for you to know what's happening in our industry when it comes to you know, inspections and compliance. So uh, these are just the most recent, I mean, it's pages and pages across the country of uh, dental practices receiving inspections, but these were the ones that kind of stood out to me a little bit. Uh, in Maryland, a uh, dentist uh, just recently permanently surrendered his license due to egregious CDC violations. Uh, that will happen if a, a dental practice, um, there's just no end in sight. The dentist uh, cannot afford to update the practice to get it into compliance, or there was some other type of violation that was so egregious that the dentist would rather surrender the license instead of having it on record that their license was taken away. Uh, in Massachusetts, an oral maxillofacial dentist was fined $5,800 by OSHA. Uh, when OSHA finds you uh, typically in the sterilization area or for an area that could cross over into uh, infection prevention and control, uh, a lot of times it is with the bloodborne pathogen standard, or now OSHA is starting to find for malfunctioning autoclaves. So there was a lot of that going on with this particular incident. Uh, uh, in Washington state, a dentist gets immediate suspension for failure to conduct score testing. That is another task that OSHA is now fining dental practices for. Uh, their reasoning behind that is because they feel like it's an employee hazard to have a malfunctioning autoclave. If the team member uh, thinks 
that the cycle has completed and that they are about to deal with uh, sterilized instruments. So they are grabbing the pouches or the wrapped cassettes with bare hands after they've performed hand hygiene, of course. Um, and there happens to be an instrument that has broken through the wrap or the pouch and punctures that team member. Uh, that's an employee hazard because the team member was under the impression that this equipment is working properly. And so OSHA is saying that, hey, we need to do better in this area. So you need to be testing to make sure that your autoclave is functioning properly and actually sterilizing the patient care items. Uh, another in Washington state, a dentist refused an inspection. I'm here to tell you as an inspector, please do not do that. Um, with dental board inspections, for the most part across the country, uh, when you, you know, if you're a dental practice owner that's here on the line tonight, um, you agreed to allow the dental board to come in if there was a complaint submitted. Uh, if you work at most states, it's complaint driven, but you agreed when you opened up a dental practice that the board could come in and do an inspection with OSHA. Uh, you are allowed to reschedule. However, uh, I do not recommend that because uh, you want to be able to have the inspection, uh, get it completed and find out what's going on so you can get the, you know, get it resolved. And then lastly, there's just a backlog of cases due to COVID that are being investigated across the country. So, uh, you know, everything shut down, as we know, in COVID, and there's just a lot more um, inspections. I will say this, that in the states that I work in, I work across the country, um, there are a lot of patients that are submitting complaints. Uh, you know, they're more educated now. They had time during COVID to Google, to watch the news, to uh, research and learn things. And so they're much more educated. Their IQ is higher when it comes to infection control and prevention. Uh, their terms are sanitary, clean. They're paying attention to us doing certain things in the practice. They're paying attention to if you're pulling these instruments out of sterilized pouches. Are you, you know, when you're unwrapping the cassette, uh, they're, they have an understanding now of what to expect when, when they walk in to receive dental care. So it is very important that we make sure that every area is in compliance in our practice because patients are watching. So what is infection prevention and control, IPC? The CDC says that infection control prevents or stops the spread of infections in healthcare settings. And the World Health Organization, a little bit more uh, scientific definition, they say that IPC is a practical evidence-based approach which prevents patients and health workers from being harmed by avoidable infection and as a result of antimicrobial resistance. So that is what we are going to be talking tonight based off of these definitions. The purpose for proper sterilization is to make sure that we're delivering safe dentistry with patient care items that have been properly sterilized. Who regulates IPC? It, it works a little differently um, in each state. So we'll start with the CDC. The CDC is not a legal entity. They are an organization, a department of the government. They do not submit legislation. However, if you practice in a state where your state dental board has written into the Dental Practice Act or uh, somewhere in their guidelines for you as a licensed healthcare provider that they want you to uh, adhere to CDC guidelines for dental, uh, uh, dental settings, then that state is what we call CDC compliant. So those recommendations now go to requirements. And there are a lot of states across the country. I urge you to go on to your state dental board website, try to find the Dental Practice Act and look through it, okay? And read through it to find out if your uh, state is CDC compliant, okay? So otherwise, the CDC's mission is they are all about promoting, uh, you know, safe practices for the public. They protect the public. So they make these recommendations. They gather data from different scientific, uh, you know, scientific studies and things like that. And then they make recommendations. The next, uh, you know, kind of department that regulates IPC is OSHA. So OSHA is actually a legal agency. They do submit legislation. They are federal. Uh, so 
any practice in the United States has to abide by OSHA. And their mission is to protect employees and make sure employees are working in a safe environment. And then lastly, you have your dental board. And then depending on the state, it could be the health department. Uh, but we'll, we'll just use the dental board for tonight's purposes. Uh, every state has a dental board and they are there to protect the interest of the public by regulating us as dental health care providers. And so what they also do is execute sanctions if it's necessary. Now, I just mentioned that most states are complaint driven. Uh, so that means that the dental board is not going to show up randomly. But there are some states who do random inspections. Um, and it just depends. I would definitely recommend that you find out if you don't know how your state conducts the uh, inspections. It is important for you to know some states, if it's not, if it's, um, if it's random inspections, they'll send a letter. And then some states, um, I'm told they just show up. So it just depends. Okay, so definitely contact your dental board. And typically, they will have that information on the dental board website, but they might not. So you might need to make a call to someone at the dental board to verify. Now, getting started, where do we actually start? I often do a lot of training where teams tend to be under the impression that IPC is strictly for the clinical team. And it's really not. It's, it's a team approach. There's administrative measures that can be carried out that are you know, guidelines and mandated uh, that can be carried out by the administrative team. And then there obviously are clinical tasks, but overall it's a team approach. So everybody needs to participate in making sure that the dental practice has a strong infection prevention and control program. We also have an ethical and, you know, ethical obligation. And many times we're just so focused on the legal mandates and the laws and what we're supposed to do. But when you look at the code of ethics, and I have them here, if you look at uh, the ones that are in this teal color, these are, you know, this is what we pledge to do for our patients, individual autonomy and respect for human beings. People have the right to be treated with respect. Well, it is respectful for us to maintain uh, infection prevention and control in our office and to do, you know, good faith efforts to make sure that we are preventing the spread of infection. Societal trust. Our patients are trusting that we are doing the right thing, okay? So they might not always ask us. Um, some patients, it doesn't even come up into their mind because they are it's just an understanding that when you walk into a, a, a healthcare facility, that you're not going to be harmed in any way. Uh, Non-maleficence, you know, we accept the, the fundamental obligation to provide services in a manner that protects our patients, okay? Um, that's involved with, you know, regarding the dental treatment that we're delivering. We want to make sure that we are protecting them. And then beneficence, that's the primary role of promoting the well-being of individuals by engaging in health promotion and disease prevention. That is what we are doing tonight. We need to make sure that we are staying up to date on guidelines. We need to make sure that in our practices, we are implementing all the guidelines that are necessary to prevent the spread of infection. It is our legal and ethical obligation to our patients. Which brings me to our Hippocratic Oath. So whether you're a dentist, whether you're a dental hygienist, we have a Hippocratic Oath. We make a pledge that we are going to improve oral health for the public, advance the art and science of, of dentistry or dental hygiene, promote high standards of care. We pledge that we're gonna improve our knowledge, right? And our skills, and that's what we're doing here tonight. Uh, you know, we pledge that we will render a full measure of service to each patient entrusted to our care. So that means that's where that societal trust comes in. We're going to uphold the highest standards of professional competence and personal conduct. We're going to do what we need to do when it comes to infection prevention and control. We're not going to cut corners because we have an ethical obligation to not cut corners. Uh, you know, we're going to make sure that we're giving each and every patient the same treatment. You know, we're going to make sure that we are wiping down every room. We're going to make sure that our sterilization is compliant because we want to be able to deliver safe dentistry to every single patient that walks through the doors.
And now that I'm off my soapbox, <laughs> uh, but you know, I do like to talk about that because it is important. We get sometimes caught up in uh, the legal ramifications, but from an ethical standpoint, we have a responsibility. It is a public health issue. Uh, you know, infection prevention in dental practices is a public health issue. There are a lot of practices that are not adhering. And just because they don't make the news or nobody's ever gotten sick from, you know, not doing a guideline does not mean that you are not, uh, you know, increasing the risk for harm to your patients or even to yourself. So that's why I like to talk about, uh, you know, our ethical obligations as well. Now, after now that we realize, okay, we're legally and ethically obligated, the first place you want to start, I always recommend, is with your written policies. Uh, it is important that your written protocols and policies are just that. They need to be written. They need to be on site. Sometimes I walk into practices where the practice owner might have multiple locations. It is not okay for you to have your standard operating procedures at location A, but you don't have a copy at location B because you think that you're okay with them just being at one location. As an inspector, if I come in to inspect location B, you need to, I need to be able to ask you, hey, let me see your standard operating procedures for your sterilization area, and you need to be able to produce them. It's not okay for you to say to me, I'm going to drive over there, or I'll have somebody bring them over, because they're supposed to be on site at all times, because all team members are supposed to have access to these standard operating procedures. Um, they include reprocessing protocol. Uh, how would you deal with a spore test failure? Um, it also includes if the team is trained and what specifically are they trained on when it comes to sterilization. Typically, OSHA binders have all of these written protocols in, you know, in them, right? So it depends on where you purchase your OSHA binder. Remember, every single dental practice across the country needs to have an OSHA manual, okay? Uh, specifically for dental, dental settings. Uh, there are a couple different places you can purchase, you know, ADA has one, OSHAmanual.com, depending on, you know, what your budget is, but you would go there and you would purchase that manual. Now, both, both types of manuals, you know, regardless of where you get it, they're going to have universal written protocols for sterilization, but they're also going to have an area where you actually have to customize how does sterilization happen in your practice? So do you um, have, you know, does, do you transport the patient care items in a, in a closed container? Uh, when, do you put them in a pre-soak before they go into the ultrasonic because you're an oral surgery office and you're very busy? Uh, do they go right into the ultrasonic? Do you use cassettes? Do you uh, just have loose instruments? Those are the types of things that need to be customized in these written protocols. And this is mandatory. And when, as an inspector, when we ask for this information and we see it and we're reading through it, if we don't see that happening, OK, um, if we don't see it executed the way it's written, there's going to be some questions. Now, depending on the state, depending on your inspector, they might not be so forgiving. Some inspectors are more forgiving than others, but you really just don't want to take that chance. OK, so you want to make sure that you have written standard operating procedures. If you have an OSHA binder that you've created yourself and you don't have uh, SOPs for your sterilization area, you need to get those written, okay? And typically what I recommend for my clients is to have the infection control coordinator write those uh, SOPs out for the sterilization area. One of the big things with sterilization is if I can't, if you don't remember any other point, if I don't drive any other point home for you, you need to remember that the sterilization is an area in the dental setting where this has to have a proper sequence every single time. There is no room for error. There is no room for switching up the steps, okay? Um, you really don't have a lot of wiggle room when it comes to sterilization. Now, when you are talking about environmental infection prevention where, and, and this means you know, you're turning over your room or you're cleaning your room, 
you're allowed to choose the brand of disinfectant. You're allowed to switch around the steps. Do you wipe the chair off first or do you, and then you take the instruments to the sterilization or do you take the sterilization instruments first and then you come back and wipe the room down? You're allowed to kind of customize it based on your, your setting, your schedule, and even the individual healthcare, okay, uh, healthcare provider, but you still need to get it done. When it comes to sterilization, you don't have room to switch the steps around, okay? The steps are in a certain order based on evidence, scientific evidence. Many, many studies have been done for this proven protocol uh, to ensure that every single patient care item that goes through this process is sterilized on the other end. So you can really only, your wiggle room is basically the brand of autoclave equipment or the brand of ultrasonic uh, cleaner that you're using or enzymatic cleaner, you can use a different brand. But as far as how you geographically zone out your sterilization area and the process or the journey that the patient care item takes, there's, there's no, you don't get to change that around. So that is very, very important as we are going to go through this information tonight. Critical care categories are what you need to kind of look at before we start talking about this journey that these patient care items are going to take. So there's three different categories that the CDC has. And the first one is critical. So this would be any item that is going to penetrate bone. Then you have your semi-critical. These are the items that are going to uh, come in contact with mucous membranes. And then your non-critical are going to be patient care items that come in contact with intact skin. So that would be like your blood pressure cuff or your radiograph tube, okay? So typically with non-critical, those items can be disinfected. We're going to focus mostly on the critical and semi-critical tonight because these are the items that need to be sterilized. These are the items that need to go through this journey in the proper sequence every single time, no matter which patient you see, no matter which procedure you deliver, no matter what the dental setting is. So if you're in a mobile setting, you're going to think about your setting and you're going to set up your sterilization area the way that we talk about it tonight. If you're in hospital based, typically they're already set up like that. Or if you're in a private practice, you're going to make sure that regardless of the space that you have, whether it's a U shape, whether it's an L shape, whether it's just a small, I call it an I shape, whatever space that you have, it needs to be set up accordingly based on what we talk about tonight. So I'm going to show you guys a video. This is a video from the CDC, and it goes over exactly how your sterilization area should be set up. And once we complete the video, we'll talk a little bit more. So let's take a look. Dental healthcare personnel should reprocess all instruments in a designated central processing area to more easily control quality and ensure patient safety. This area should be divided into sections for receiving, decontamination, and cleaning, preparation and packaging, sterilization, and storage. To prevent cross-contamination, the instrument processing area should have a workflow pattern designed to ensure that devices and instruments clearly flow from high contamination areas to clean and sterile areas. In the receiving area, Reusable contaminated instruments, supplies, and equipment are received, sorted, decontaminated, and cleaned. In the preparation and packaging area, the cleaned instruments and other dental supplies are inspected, assembled into sets or trays, and then wrapped, packaged, or placed into container systems for sterilization. The sterilization area should include the sterilizers and related supplies with adequate space for loading, unloading, and cool down. The area can also include incubators for analyzing spore tests. Finally, the storage area should contain enclosed storage for sterile items, as well as disposable or single-use items. Dental supplies should not be stored under sinks or in other locations where they might become wet. Now, the video talks about the different zones. So here's a good picture of, you know, regardless, like I said, regardless of, you know, the shape of your sterilization area, uh, you want to make sure that you have clearly defined workflow zones. Uh, there's two reasons why you want 
workflow zones. Um, one, it's just more efficient. It will definitely, there's been several studies where it will allow you to gain time throughout your day. So if you have an unorganized sterilization area, uh, you know, it ends up taking, you know, you as a provider, or if you are the dentist and you have an assistant that's assisting you, it's taking them longer to get these patient care items through the process because things are unorganized. So think about what you could do if you could gain an extra two to three minutes per patient. You know, if you're seeing 10 patients and you're gaining two to three minutes per patient, that's 20 to 30 minutes. Sometimes, um, you know, it can take, uh, you know, healthcare providers five extra minutes per patient because of the disorganization in the sterilization area. So if you think about that, that's almost a whole full hour that another task could be done. Maybe even another patient could be seen. And so think about, you know, that type of ROI, you know, that would be why you would want to organize it. But also having an organized sterilization area is going to reduce the risk for injury. You know, you're not going to have, uh, you know, anyone in the sterilization area that could potentially get injured by um, bumping into each other, um, grabbing instruments that aren't sterilized properly. So a host of things. But Th those are just two of the main reasons why you want to make sure that you have a good workflow zone that's clearly organized and defined. So these are the four uh, zones that we're going to talk about tonight. And let's talk about the uh, cleaning zone. Okay. So this zone is going to house, this is where you have your ultrasonic cleaner. Okay. And Couple of things when it comes to your ultrasonic cleaner. If you look at this picture right here on the slide, you'll notice a couple of things. They've got the ultrasonic cleaner. It's next to the sink, right? For easy, uh, you know, uh, when you have to dump the water and the solution out. If you notice also they have two pictures up and then right in the middle, they have a, a label that says dirty. Some states require the sterilization area to have a sign that says dirty on the dirty side and clean on the clean side. Then there are other states that don't really have a guide, a guideline and, and, or a mandate. I recommend that you do this regardless, because if, you know, now with staff shortages, a lot of offices across the country are inviting temporary employees in, right? And they're going from uh, practice to practice. They don't know how, you know, it's a brand new area for them. They're trying to find things, you know, sometimes it can get a little tough. So they more organized. And, uh, and clear that you can make things, the easier it's going to be for these temp employees, but also the easier it's going to be for you as the dental health care provider when you are in there to, you know, process these instruments. So you want to make sure that everything is clearly defined. Be sure to follow the manufacturer instructions for use on the solution of the enzymatic cleaner in your ultrasonic. Um, just a couple side notes, uh, you know, two things. If you use enzymatic cleaner, that is, uh, you know, if you use, if you don't use the right ratio, what can happen is you can damage the instruments um, and it can really cause, you know, decrease the life of, of the instrument. Um, the other thing is, if you don't use the right ratio, you can actually not really clean the instruments properly. You don't have enough enzymatic cleaner in there to really cleanse the debris from the patient care items. So make sure you're following manufacturing factor instructions for that. Don't overload this. Okay. We will notice that as an inspector, if I come in and I notice that you are overloading, um, that's something that I'm going to question you about potentially, because what happens is all of the surfaces of that patient care item are not exposed. So they're not able to get cleansed properly. Um, only used approved solutions. If I see that you're not using, uh, if you're using a, a solution that's off label, like a bleach, or I've even walked in and I've seen uh, cleaners from like that I know were purchased out of like a, a five and dime or a dollar store or something like that. Um, um, those are being used off label. And remember the ultrasonic cleaner is, is approved by the FDA. It's regulated by the FDA. It's, um, so all of this equipment, uh, that we are using, we have to use it properly and we have to use proper solutions that go in, you know, the proper, um, equipment. So you need to make sure that you're doing that. Are you drying, um, the instruments? Um, what are you using to dry the instruments? In this particular picture, they were using cloth uh, uh, material, like a cloth material. It was like a big um, kind of cloth and it was cotton. I'm going to ask you, how are you laundering those? 
Uh, are they being laundered on site? Are you taking them home to your to your personal uh, you know laundry room in your home? How is this happening? Are they even being laundered? Is going to be my question, my first question. Then I'm going to ask you where is the laundering happening? Uh, because I've walked into practices where they're they've never. Uh, actually laundered these cloths. And I mean, from an infection control standpoint, the bio burden that's on these cloths is very high. And so you have to make sure that those are being changed out if you're using reusable cloths. If you're using disposable, then no worries. But if it's reusable, you know, uh, make sure that those are being um, being uh, changed. And then lastly, you'll want to make sure that you have a GHS label. So that's the Global Harmonized System uh, uh, program that it's a classification system that the United States has now implemented. Uh, the rest of the world had implemented it first, and then we came on board and connected with the rest of the world. So it's called GHS. And what these labels do is they inform the operator of what chemical is inside the ultrasonic. So whatever solution you're using, you're going to write on that label what the name of that solution is. You're also going to look on the solution's original container and read through the product label, and you're going to put on the GHS label what PPE needs to be worn when dealing with this solution. Uh, is it hazardous to their health? Is it poisonous? Is it um, flammable? What is it? You will find all of that information on the original container that the enzymatic solution came into. But this needs to literally be stuck onto the ultrasonic cleaner. Again, another layer, another safeguard to reduce any type of injury to the operator, but also um, it allows us to make sure that we're staying compliant with, um, with OSHA guidelines. Now, zone maintenance. So in the cleaning zone, there's some maintenance that we have to do. One of the things that you have to do in this zone is you have to do daily equipment cleaning of your ultrasonic. You should not be leaving this solution in overnight. You should not be, um, you know, leaving it in. I've seen, I've seen it where I walk in and it's cloudy. That uh, enzymatic cleaner and water, that means it's been there for a very long time. And if you look, read the manufacturer instructions for use, you're supposed to, uh, pretty much most of the brands on the market will tell you to dump daily. The other um, equipment maintenance you want to do is make sure that you are testing the ultrasonic on a regular basis. So you need to look at the, uh, the manufacturer handbook for your ultrasonic to find out how often do you need to test it. The purpose of testing your ultrasonic uh, unit is to make sure that the transducers, the, the, um, the little accessories, the pieces inside the machine are actually agitating right, and creating the cavitation that helps to cleanse the patient care items. As an inspector, you're going to be asked, are you, are you testing your ultrasonic? If so, where's the documentation for that? If you've been doing it and you um, haven't been documenting it, you need to be documenting it so that you can prove that you've been doing it. There's an HR rule that says if it wasn't written down, it never happened. And most inspectors go by that rule. OK, now one of the there's two ways you can purchase um, a foil test from a dental supply company or you can do a actual foil test. So some people don't know what a foil test is. So I have a video here. Let's let's just take a look at this quick video. And half and it should be the length of your ultrasonic. When you're doing it, the tinfoil should never touch the bottom. It should just be floating in the middle. And you're going to want to hold it while it's going for one minute. Never want to put your hands into the ultrasonic bath. So when you think about it, the bones in your hands are pretty tiny, they're pretty delicate, and if you're putting them in there while it's shaking, who knows what it's doing to those tiny little bones. So after a minute, yep. you'll take your tinfoil out and you should see little holes in your tinfoil. If you don't see holes in your tinfoil, your ultrasonic bath isn't shaking how it should, 
and it probably will need to be guys, serviced. What uh, they were trying to tell you at the end of that video is once you do the one minute for the foil, you pull it out and you should see little small holes along the bottom, the whole entire bottom of that piece of tin foil. If you don't see the holes, that means one side, that one transducer is not working properly and you will not, it's, it's not going to agitate and create the cavitation that we need to cleanse the patient care items. Uh, most manufacturer for ultrasonics will say clean it once, uh, I'm sorry, test once a month, uh, but you will want to look back at your um, manufacturer. They give you like a in instructional manual and take a look at that. These are the common violations that happen in the cleaning zone. There's no documentation of equipment maintenance. This happens all the time. So while you might be cleaning everything and, and you know, foil testing, if you're not documenting it, uh, we don't know that it happened. No utility gloves being worn. This is a huge one that most of the offices that I've uh, officially inspected um, have gotten a lot of violations for that. Um, let's see, no cleaning protocol for drying cloths. We just talked about that. I'm going to ask you, how are you laundering these reusable drying cloths? No GHS label on the ultrasonic some states, like I said, require dirty and clean signs. And then there's no manufacturer instructions for use um, for the handpiece auto lubricator posted near that lubricator. So what I mean by that is um, if you have this piece of equipment where your handpiece gets lubricated automatically, you are supposed to have instructions for use somewhere near this piece of equipment. So if somebody, the operator is using it and they don't know how to use it, one, they're not going to use it incorrectly, um, but two, they're not going to also damage the machine or the handpiece or, you know, the, the equipment. So make sure that those uh, instructions are near. You can post them if you have postable ones, or it could just be in a drawer near the lubricator. Next, we're moving on to the packaging zone. So we did the cleaning zone, which is zone one. So zone two is packaging. Now with packaging, it is required that you use FDA approved packaging materials. So every single practice should be, or setting should be ordering their packaging materials from a dental supply company or a medical supply company. There is no wrapping it with something else that you found uh, from a, a site maybe on Amazon or something like that that's not, uh, you know, earmarked for, uh, you know, sterilization for medical devices. So it has to be FDA approved. You need to make sure there's a proper seal. We do look at that. Uh, we look at, are you packaging everything properly? If you overfold your pouches, uh, what happens is you don't allow the proper sterilant penetration to happen. And therefore, you're, it, just because the indicator changes doesn't mean that the right environment was met inside of that pouch because it wasn't sealed. So we're not totally sure that the patient care items got properly sterilized. Uh, hinged instruments have to be pouched uh, open so that you know, there every single surface is exposed. Um, internal and external indicators. This is a biggie. Uh, definitely can sometimes be a violation. You want to make sure you're using pouches that have multi-parameter. So you want a multi-parameter pouch. Uh, look at the look at the the packaging that your pouches come in and make sure that it's multi-parameter. If not, you need to order multi-parameter. That means um, you have internal and external indicators and some other parameters that are, it lets you know that all the parameters are met that need to be. And then with your wraps, if you're using cassettes and you're wrapping, the tape on the outside is your external indicator, but you have to have an internal indicator inside the cassette so that you can ensure that the proper sterilant penetration uh, was met inside that cassette. It is not okay to take the external tape, fold it, and tape it to the inside of the, um, you know, to the inside of the, of you know, a piece of the cassette, and then wrap that whole thing and use that as your internal indicator. That's not okay. You have to actually purchase internal um, indicators and you need to put those in each and every cassette. Okay. Um, I did see, I do see a quick question here where it says, please explain more on the hinged instruments. The purpose for the hinged instruments being open, you have to have, you can't have it closed tight 
because the, the portion that's closed tight, like let's say on hemostats, okay, uh, that's not open, it's closed. And so that surface, okay, since it's closed, uh, is not exposed to be sterilized. Labeling, pretty self-explanatory, but this is a common violation. If you're not labeling, this is uh, your, your pouches, CDC states that you need to do this. Uh, the reason being is this allows you to track any errors or anything like that. So you do need to make sure that you are labeling the every single pouch or wrapped cassette that goes into the autoclave. It just allows you to track if one of your autoclaves or if the autoclave that you have has malfunctioned, you'll be able to go and collect all of those uh, unsterilized pouches or cassettes from circulation so that they're not being used on patients because they weren't properly sterilized. Unwrapped instruments. So this is a great picture. Uh, you cannot have uh, instruments like this or patient care items out like this. This is definitely an infection uh, control violation. Um, most people don't perform proper hand hygiene. So they're just grabbing, uh, you know, they're grabbing at loose items with, um, you know, without doing hand hygiene, which is cross contamination, and now you're going to use it on a on a patient. Also, this is a, a medical device that's regulated by the FDA, and tell and FDA says you have to follow manufacturer instructions for use. So something like this, your X-ray uh, XCPs and things. If you look at the manufacturer instructions for use, they tell you that you have to sterilize these between every patient. So we definitely need to make sure that you are. Um, uh, autoclaving them. If you want to autoclave anything unwrapped, it can be unwrapped, but it must be used for immediate use. So you can't unwrap it and then store it in this drawer like you see in this picture and use it like next week. It has to be used immediately for the current patient that you're with. Otherwise, it needs to be pouched or wrapped. Common violations, I kind of just talked about this. Unwrapped instruments that aren't being immediately used Damaged pouches or wraps that are stored. We're going to talk about how to properly store uh, sterile instruments. No labeling. Open pouches or wrap cassettes still in circulation. I've seen this so many times. That's a definite violation. Um, and then hinged instruments, sterilized clothes. That means, you know, they're not open. And so we don't know if the surface that was touching, you know, that was closed on those hemostats, we don't know if it got sterilized properly. Your next zone, which is zone three, this is the sterilizing zone. In the sterilizing zone, that's gonna have our autoclave equipment, right? Our autoclave or our statum, maybe you have one, maybe you have two, maybe you have three. I don't know, it just depends on your setting, okay, your dental setting, but you need to make sure that you're following the manufacturer instructions for use for each cycle. This is very important. If you're running it while I'm there inspecting the office and I see an operator open the autoclave before it's finished, that is something that will go into my report. Because by not allowing the autoclave to properly dry the instruments, most likely those instruments are gonna be stored wet. And when they're stored wet, it encourages rust, it can encourage bacteria, all kinds of stuff to kind of grow in that wet environment and if it's not properly done. So you wanna make sure that you're allowing the dry cycle to um, finish because manufacturer instructions say to, and it's a medical device regulated by the FDA. And my job as an inspector is to make sure you're doing that properly. Um, use of mitts or tray handling tool. I walk into a lot of offices and I don't see these items. Are you just pulling these, you know, hot instruments, hot pouches and cassettes out, you know, that you can increase uh, uh, risk for burning, you know, burning yourself or something like that. So we need to be able to see these items. It's an OSHA issue. Okay. And for employee safety purposes, you need to have these items available to the team so that they can properly and safely use this autoclave equipment. And then weekly spore testing. This is, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is the only way that you can track if your uh, sterilization equipment is doing its job. So it needs to be done weekly on every single piece of sterilizing equipment. So if you have a statum, it needs to be done. And if you have an autoclave, it needs to be done and it needs to be documented. Typically, um, most offices will send it out to a third party, which is fine, but just make sure you can have access to those um, uh, reports and everything in those results. If you get a fail, what, what we look for as an inspector is if I see a fail, 
I want to see within the within 24 hours or 48 hours, I need to see that you did another test right away. I can't wait a whole week because if you got to fail and you wait a whole week, how do you know that it wasn't the autoclave that failed? You can't just blame it all the time on operator error, okay? If you are doing in-office spore testing, what is recommended is that you make sure that you document it in the little book that comes with the in-office kit. And once, like once a quarter or maybe even once a month, you might want to send it out to get third-party verification. Uh, it's just good. It's good practice to just, if you're going to do something in office, make sure you have a third party to verify that everything is working properly. Sterilization monitoring. These are the three different kind of um, uh, ways that you can monitor. Um, mechanical, always check to make sure, you know, checking the gauges, looking at the displays, making sure that the cycle is, is uh, you know, happening you know, properly, chemical, using those pouches with multi-parameters, okay, making sure that you are putting a indicator inside your cassette, your wrapped cassettes. Biological, gold standard, that's what you see here. This is an in-office um, incubator that you can do, uh, or if you send it out third party, typically those strips, but that's the gold standard, but it must be performed weekly and make sure, excuse me, that you are Placing that spore strip according to the manufacturer instructions for use. So most of them will tell you in the middle. They won't tell you on the top or the bottom tray. They'll tell you right in the middle. But read the label, okay? Read the manufacturer instructions to make sure you are placing that strip correctly. Zone maintenance. So for this um, zone, you want to make sure that you are documenting equipment cleaning. In, earlier in the course, I mentioned that OSHA is now violating dental practices for malfunctioning autoclaves, okay? You have to make sure that you're maintaining it and you're documenting that you're maintaining it. If you ever go before the board or if you're involved in a mal, uh, malpractice suit and they attach an infection control inspection onto that, you are going to need to provide these documents, okay? So make sure you're documenting when you clean the equipment, um, uh, when you're doing the spore testing, all of that kind of stuff. Also, you have to have sterilization equipment manufacturer instructions for use either posted or near in a drawer somewhere near this equipment. That is also something um, that's on a, a typical inspector's list. They are supposed to check most dental, uh, most, I'm sorry, most states go, use the CDC checklist for uh, dental settings. And so most of us use that. That's the checklist that we use. And I can give you more information when we get to the Q&A, but um, you know, that mo most, most of the, the dental boards use that as their inspection list. So you certainly could take a look at that and say, hmm, okay, we need to make sure we're doing this, but that's something that's on there that we have to check for to make sure that those instructions are posted near the autoclave in the statum. Common violations, uh, I pretty much covered this. Um, no weekly spore testing, no documentation of equipment maintenance, um, no mitts or tray handling tool, and no written manufacturer instructions for use uh, in the sterilization area for the equipment that's responsible for sterilizing. And lastly, the fourth zone we have is our storing zone. And so in the storing zone, you have to make sure that you place everything in covered cabinets, closed cabinets, examine the packaged instruments prior to use, repackage if compromised, and then keep wrapped until the point of use. You definitely want to make sure that you are um, following this protocol because again, we're using that checklist and on that checklist, it asks us about these items. Uh, the, these those tasks. Um, items not stored in a sterile environment, that's a common violation. Compromised packaging, again, I've, in, I've inspected a lot of offices and uh, it's routinely seen where packaging has been compromised and it's still in rotation to be used on a patient. And then items being stored unwrapped, we saw those XEPs uh, in that drawer, even though it was a covered drawer, all the XEPs are unwrapped in that, that will be definitely a violation. Some additional required items in your sterilization area. Make sure you have a hazard communication poster. You literally can Google this and buy it 
from anywhere, really Amazon, anywhere. Sterilization equipment uh, instructions for use, mitts or trays, your GHS label, dirty and clean signs, utility gloves, utility gloves, utility gloves. They cannot be underneath the sink behind a, a, a bottle of bleach because that would be considered, <laughs> I, I assume that they're not being used and most likely they're not. So you wanna make sure that they're out and they're displayed so that people see them, encourage everybody to use them. If you are a healthcare provider and you're not using them, you need to make sure that you are using them. They, they protect you from chemical exposure as well as uh, um, per, percutaneous, okay? And then long handle steel brush, this is important. I was in an office doing an inspection uh, about a month ago and I saw the dental assistant, they didn't have a long handle brush. She had a cavi wipe because that's the wipes that they used. And she, was, she had the instrument in one hand, the sharp instrument, she was taking cavi wipe and wiping each instrument. She wasn't using the long handle brush. They weren't using an ultrasonic uh, cleaner and she was just literally manually cleaning each one and then putting it into the pouch. That's an absolute no-no, that's a violation. Um, and uh, that definitely be, will be written into, could be written into um, your uh, the report that the inspector has for the dental board. All right, okay. Um, now, I want to just quickly just go over a few. We're gonna quickly move through these. The biggest thing here for a special consideration is the PPE. It's mandated by OSHA. Make sure all of these items are worn when you are reprocessing instruments, okay? Um, especially, you know, if you have an inspector there, you need to have this on. But more importantly, you don't wanna just do it just because the inspector is there. Because I promise you, if you do not practice and have good practices, you will forget to do it when the inspector is there and we will see what's really going on in the practice. So we talked about a legal obligation. We talked about an ethical obligation. You need to make sure you are wearing personal protective equipment when you're reprocessing instruments because one, for safety purposes, and two, because you want to make sure that there's no cross-contamination and things like that. Um, also, make sure that uh, transporting, let me push this to you guys, instrument transport, all contaminated instruments need to be transported to the sterilization area in a leak-proof container. And then lastly, before we get to the questions, I just want to make sure that I show you guys some of these um, violations. Here is uh, instructions for use. They're behind the equipment. They need to be able to be seen. You can't do, you do that. Um, let's see. This is kind of self-explanatory. I mean, I don't see anybody using anything in this basket. It looks like like it's just a catch-all and that would definitely go in my report because I would know you're not using the uh, uh, utility gloves. Um, this is great. You were almost there, but we don't have a top. So you need to have a top. These are instrument contaminated instrument transporting containers, but they need to be, um, they need to have tops so that if anybody were to bump into each other, the instruments wouldn't come out of the uh, containers. Let's see, uh, no labeling on the pouches. So we talked about that, common violations. Cold sterile, I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with cold sterile. Um, two things, number one, most of the items that people are putting in cold sterile shouldn't even be in there. It's either single use or supposed the manufacturer tells you to sterilize it. And number two, um, it, uh, it, um, has to be monitored daily and it's not a set it and forget it. Like you put it on, you know, you, you put the, you put the um, date on it and then you move on. It, it has to be monitored daily. If you don't have time to do that, then you need to just get rid of it. Uh, open hand pieces. Hand pieces are not allowed to be put onto units like this. You have to open them when the patient arrives. This is the compromised packaging for sterile storage. And then lastly, we have food items in the in the sterilization area. Cannot do that at all. Cannot do that. So I definitely want to recommend you guys make sure that you are um, avoiding all of that. So let's see. Lastly, just think of a pie, an apple pie. Plan, implement, educate. Plan, look at your area, make sure you plan it, and 
then you want to implement. You want to zone everything out, organize it, get all your equipment in there that you are mandated to have, make sure everything is in the required area or the uh, required zones. And then lastly, educate. Everybody needs to get educated on what the new workflow is, anything that's going to be implemented that's brand new, anything like that. Make sure that your established team and also new hires know what is the protocol in this practice for reprocessing an instrument? What does the sterilization area look like? And how am I supposed to flow in this area? Okay. And then I think we have our Q&A now. So I'm going to look at some Q&A, Gary, if you want to kind of do yeah. a rapid fire session. I kind of, it was a lot of it. I could go on for hours. <laughs> with this. <laughs> I know, but such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. And we do have questions based on okay. the different categories, I think. So okay. many of them duplicate. Okay. Uh, on labeling the pouches on the clear mm -hmm. plastic side or on the paper side? Uh, paper side, typically more above towards the top, um, not like in the middle. And then also make sure you're using a waterproof heat resistant marker so that the writing doesn't ink doesn't bleed so that you can actually read what you wrote. Uh, and then you put date or cycle yes, number. You put, you put cycle um, number. Is it yes, for the day? You, you put the date, you put, here we go. There we go. Date, cycle number, packager initials, which is the operator initials. If you're using multiple sterilizers, like you have to do an internal labeling system. So if you have more than one piece of autoclave equipment, one will be A, one will be B or one, two, three or whatever. And then uh, waterproof and heat resistant marker. And it is cycle for the day. And you put the cycle. No, 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 no. The cycle is you could do like four cycles in a day. So every time you run it, that's a cycle. Yeah. For Does that makes sense. Every time. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then back on uh, retesting the spore test. Uh, you mentioned okay. retest immediately. How do you describe uh -huh. that? When do you describe that? Uh, so, what I mean by typically, if you send it to a third party, they will make a phone call to your office and they will tell somebody, whoever picked up the phone, wherever they're supposed to talk to that your spore test failed. As soon as you find that out, you need to run the spore test that day. And then you need to send in, send it in that day. Uh, you don't want to wait a whole another week till you're due again. That's what I mean by running it immediately. If you okay. find that it fails with an in-office, you just run it right away. Okay. And we already heard your fondness of cold sterilization. <laughs> Um, yeah, how, I'm not a fan. How do you of that. store them? If you do it correctly, how would you store the cold <laughs> sterilization? Store the cold sterile. Oh, geez. Well, it depends on what, if that person that asked that question, can you put, what items are you putting in the cold sterile? And that'll let me know. That'll tell me how to answer that question. So if you could put that in the chat. Okay. Martina, because if you most want of to the respond items to that, that yeah. would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can we place disposable bite wings, PAs, tips all in a covered container and grab with clean hands? Yes. Yes. Okay, good answer. Because they're disposable. Yep. <laughs> if I need to label a sterilization pouch with a marker, can I write on the clear side or paper side? We already got that. Yeah, we paper, talked about right? that. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are using stamps, by the way, guys. So they're they're ordering these waterproof, heat-resistant stampers. And so they're customizing them. So it's really easy. You just stamp a whole bunch at the beginning of the day. And then all you have to do is like write minimal information. And in. so it's pretty cool. Apparently it's sold. One of my practices got it off Amazon and they customized the stamper. And so that makes that whole labeling much more efficient. Hmm. Uh, the manufacturer's instructions for use. Uh, it's just a question. Is it an instruction booklet? Not necessarily, right? I mean, Not necessarily. It could be the, the manual that came with the piece of equipment or some of the autoclave equipment because they know that the CDC wants the instructions and OSHA wants the instructions posted. They will. It's like a laminated poster that comes and you just put that up. You don't have to. But if you don't have that anymore, you, it never came with it. Just make sure that handbook is in the sterilization area yeah. somewhere and it's easily accessible. All right. If they have an ultrasonic for cleaning dentures and partials, where would that be located ideally? And not the same. Um, one that as could be, it could be, I would probably put that like on like a wick. 
I would not put it on the side with all the dirty instruments and everything like that. I might put that like on its own separate area, maybe on the clean side. Be sure that you have you are placing um, uh, you are placing the denture and the partial inside of a plastic bag with the solution inside of a glass beaker or a hard. Uh, material and then put that into the autoclave um, because sometimes people use the ultrasonic, I'm sorry, into the ultrasonic. Sometimes people use the same ultrasonic for their dirty instruments as they are with their dentures and you don't want the dirty instruments to puncture the bag. And you, you know, you don't want the bag punctured and all that dirty solution gets in and contaminates the denture. So if you have a separate one, put it all off to the side and you should be good to go, but still put it in a container because the transducers agitate the container. Ah, good point. What will you do with instruments that are used at the end of the day that are not cleaned? Would you store them in a, coral, a cold sterile overnight until the morning to process? Or how do you store them until the next morning? Um, you would put them through the cleaning zone, put them through the packaging zone, label them, and you can load the autoclave. And then in the morning, you start the autoclave and run it. I wouldn't do, you can't, I, I wouldn't leave the stuff overnight and all that. You know, you have to remember this cold sterile is very harsh. So it reduces, if you leave certain patient care items in there, it will reduce the life of that patient care item. And depending on what you're putting in there, it could become pretty costly. Good point. Uh, let's see, we've already talked about uh, labeling on the paper side. How far apart must instruments be in a pouch? Well, you don't want to overload it. So um, that's an excellent question. You don't want to overload it because you got you have to make sure that each instrument, all the surfaces of each patient care item can be exposed. So typically in like, it really just depends on the size of the pouch. I mean, um, a typical setup, like a dental hygiene setup, if it's loose and you're not using a cassette, maybe you have four to five instruments, that would be it, plenty. You don't want to, you don't want to put 10 instruments in one of those small thin pouches because then all the surfaces aren't exposed. Uh, question here, uh, placement of the packets in the autoclave, paper side down? Uh, you have to follow the manufacturer instructions for use, but most, most autoclaves, um, if they're steam, most of the manufacturers will tell you paper side down because the steam comes from the bottom and it rises and it's able to penetrate the paper side uh, more easily than the plastic side. But I reserve the right to tell you, go and read the manufacturer instructions for use. This might be being recorded, you guys. So I have to make yeah, sure that I cover it myself. It is being recorded, just so everybody knows. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, we'll let everybody have that recording. Uh, and just in case some of you have to leave, we're just over the hour, but uh, you can get CE for this course. So please click on the CE available icon and follow the instructions there for CE. Couple more questions if you have uh, yes, time. Yes, I do. I have time. Mm -hmm. uh, can we do bleach overnight for impression trays as cold solvent? You. So you have to be careful with bleach and make sure that you're not using it off label. You have to read the label on your bleach uh, to see. Typically, I would say no. Um, I mean, I guess, well, with, with um, metal trays, typically you, you have to read the manufacturer instructions for use to see if it can be used as a cold sterile and to see how long, if you do have a bleach where you can do that, you need to make sure that you know how long that item needs to stay in the bleach in order to be disinfected, okay? You need to remember that a bleach is a disinfectant. It's not uh, a sterilant. So that that should answer your question. It really should only be used like as a, a, high, a high level disinfectant. But yeah, I, you, you would have to read the instructions for use on the bleach because all the bleaches are different too. Okay. Uh, you mentioned several times the utility gloves, making them available. Is regular latex okay? Or are you looking at more of the utility uh, 
gloves. No, you have to have utility gloves. Yeah. So you can purchase those from a hardware store. You can purchase them from a dental supply company. I recommend you try to get the ones that are, they have, they're, they're thinner. So they're easier to, you know, when you put them on, you're, you're easier, it's easier for you to maneuver and work with them. The really thick ones sometimes are hard to use and uh, team members can't even use them. So they don't. So you want to look for the ones that are thinner, but still consider utility gloves, not dishwashing gloves. Cause I've walked into offices and they've got flowers all over them and they're really <laughs> reserved for, for washing dishes. So those are not utility gloves. They're pretty, but they're not utility gloves. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, several questions. Can we label or stamp after the autoclave cycle or it has to be done before? No, they want you to do it. Um, they want you to do it before. For. It's just too much. It's just it, it, doing it before just ensures that it's done. Doing it after, sometimes people get busy. They just grab the instruments and they're setting up trays and all of that, and you don't even know which which autoclave sterilized which pouch and all that. So doing it before is is what's um uh what th that's the guideline. Okay. Um, back to the denture and, and partials. Can you double sure. bag them instead of putting in a beaker or glass container? Uh, it's no, no, because instruments could uh, puncture two bags. Puncture. So no. Mm -hmm. How long can instruments be kept in a pouch before they need to be sterilized again? If they're stored? Typically it's six months um, and wrapped is a year, but um, you, you want to, Re, I keep going back to this manufacturer instructions for use. Um, they've done some, some studies on this, um, but yeah, typically, or it could be less because if the if the stored instruments, the packaging is damaged in any way, just from drying out or being stored, um, and it starts to crack and stuff like that, it might be less. So, um, but typically, it's like a six month and then a one year. Okay. Um, a question again, back to the marker, you said uh, mm -hmm. waterproof and others. There was a question that the ink bleeds through the paper. Yeah, so they might water. need to purchase, yeah, they might need to purchase a waterproof. Um, that's one that's not waterproof that they're using. Okay, a couple questions on the sensors. Uh, the mm -hmm. sensors, and the sensor holders. Is there anything new with that? What's the best way to sterilize the sensor holders? Um, well, it depends on which ones you're using. I mean, all of your manufacturers are going to give you instructions on um, how to uh, autoclave those. You do want to be careful that you're not placing those on, if you're using a steam autoclave, that they're being, you should place them in the middle because if it's on the bottom, it could melt the plastic um, of the O-ring and the sensor and stuff because once the metal arm gets hot and it's if it's leaning against the plastic it will get uh, it will melt the plastic so you want to make sure that you place those you know there's proper placement but also look at your instructions for use because different systems different manufacturers recommend you know um, instruct you to do different things with them a uh, question for you can we put more than one pouch in a bigger pouch I, there's really, I mean, there's no guideline for that, but I will say this, it's not part of a manufacturer instruction for use and pouches are, are medical device regulated by the FDA. And so you would be using it off label. And so legally you're not supposed to do that. Okay. Uh, pouch, uh, a large one, 12 by 18 inches in a vertical position, especially if it's at a big autoclave. Yeah, yeah. So some autoclaves will tell you to load vertically. Some will say it's okay to load horizontally. You just have to read the instructions for use for that. Um, you might want to autoclave, you might want to sterilize your cassettes vertically. So you'd need like, you'd need the, the um, tray, the special tray for that. Uh, so it just depends on what you're sterilizing. And re again, refer back to the instructions for use. I'm telling you, all of this information is in that booklet. It's like your Bible for the autoclave equipment. And if you just flip through that, it gives you all the answers you need to operate uh, and you know operate the equipment properly, but also make sure that you're sterilizing 
any type of patient care item properly too. Good point. A lot of reading manufacturing instructions. <laughs> I know people don't like when I say that. They want me to give them the answer, but I'm like, oh, well, if OSHA or the dental board shows up for a surprise inspection, you brought this up at the beginning, not recommending rescheduling. Uh, this person uh, no. said they are going to reschedule. Do you have any comments to uh, expand um, on If that? you want to reschedule, the dental board, typically you can't reschedule. They're there. They're doing it. OSHA, you're allowed to reschedule um, if the practice owner isn't there um, or if the practice owner says, hey, can you come back? I don't recommend that because they don't tend to like that. Um, so you but you are more than you're within your right to do whatever you want to do. Um, but okay. just know that they might not appreciate that. And so I don't know what the attitude or the tone is going to be when they return. Great. I know you've put up the connect uh, with me information. You've got a wonderful company set up to help people with this. Do you have an office walkthrough or something they can do pre-visit to just do a yeah a fake yeah visit or a fake site yeah actually actually if you guys um on uh the app store you can go on the app store and it's called um the CDC has an app and it looks like, and it's got a tooth in it and it's called, um, let me make sure that I say this correctly, but it's called dental check. That's the name of the app. And it's a tooth with um, a circle and a white check. And that is from the CDC. Open that app. And at the very top, as soon as you open that app, it says new checklist. You will, you will tap that and the whole checklist that most dental boards use for inspections will appear. And this is the CDC, this is the CDC um, checklist uh, for dental settings. And it's, um, it's two sections. So one section is for you to assess like record keeping and, you know, all the administrative stuff. And then the second part of it is for observing. So you can actually observe what's happening in the practice throughout the day. So you pick an hour and you just observe what's happening within each operatory, what's happening in the sterilization. You're watching the team, you know, you know, perform tasks and execute protocols. And this is an excellent assessment tool uh, that could be used on an annual basis to make sure that you're staying compliant. Great. And uh, just a uh... Does your company, do, uh, can you, as uh, an inspector, can you do a, a site check? Just mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I can um, hire you to walk through. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I own a company. It's called Learn to Prevent. And um, I would never be called for conflict of interest reasons. Obviously, I would never be called to inspect one of my clients' offices. Right. Um, so if that ever came up and I, and I found out that that was my client, I would just decline. And then another inspector would go out. Um, I would have to wait ethically. I've got to wait for them to call me and say, oh my God, India, we just got, you know, the board is here or we got a letter or whatever the case may be. But yes, I do, um, do mock CDC inspections and OSHA inspections, um, for dental practices, just to make sure that they are, um, uh, compliant in everything that's going on. And it comes with some more stuff too, some other goodies that we throw in there. And just for my edification, can you do that remote or do you have to? Yes. Mm -hmm. you can no, I can do it remote. Yep. I can do it remote. Yeah. Little technology. We use technology <laughs> with that. So some FaceTime and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Utility gloves. Another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Ones without flowers. Do we need to have them or how often do you or how do you clean them and where should they store them? Uh, so some of the utility gloves that are purchased from medical and dental supply companies can be autoclaved. So you can disinfect them after each patient. So you would use them. This is for another class, but <laughs> you would use them to, you know, wipe your room down and stuff. And then you could wipe them down with your disinfectant wipes or whatever, you know, whatever you're using for disinfecting uh, your operatory. And then to store them, typically some practices will store them in the sterilization area. They'll have them hanging on clips or they'll have them over the side of cabinet doors. And then most practices that I walk into and what I recommend is that each individual clinician have their own pair and it's stored in the operatory where they work. Uh, so where, where they deliver care 
And then that way there, you can grab them easily, put them on, wipe your room down, go to the sterilization area and do what you need to do. But there's some practices that just have one pair and everybody shares. So those would be, I would suggest those be stored in the sterilization area. Okay, somebody's hungry. Um, <laughs> the uh, Another question on the utility gloves, just uh, sure. because I think a lot are using the dishwasher ones. Oh, um, okay, okay. Would they, where would you get those from? Uh, you can, uh, like you Henry can, Shine? Exactly. Yep. A distributor like Henry Shine. That's, <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. So, yeah, certainly there. And I was hoping we were going to get to 50. That would have been a record of number of questions. So, oh, we uh, didn't very, get to 50. Okay. Okay. Very okay. interesting topic. Uh, <laughs> sure. I do want to mention everybody, this has been recorded. You'll get an email in the next week or so. Uh, so, you can go through it slowly or run through it, make a list yourself. You've got the contact information uh, for India's company as well to do a mock walkthrough or get consult with you. So that's all good. Um, and then I uh, want to let you know CE is available. So please click the CE uh, button below. You can get all the information. At the end, you'll get a little survey about what you liked, didn't like, or ideas for future episodes of webinars, what information Certainly the questions and the attention and the audience certainly says this is a top subject. So India, thank you so much for providing your expertise and thank all of you for watching uh, and have a wonderful evening. And again, India, thank you for your expertise. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Bye-bye.